Welcome back to another episode of the Max Term Podcast. Kyle Stitch here alongside James Finch. And today we're talking about the Central Division, working through our kind of division by division preview as the season is quickly approaching. Really excited about that, but uh, we still have some divisions to get through. So Central Division's up today. If you missed any of our past episodes, you can find them on all major platforms looking for Max Term Podcast, searching that should get you there we appreciate you subscribing to this podcast again available pretty much anywhere you want to consume podcasts on if you have any questions for us want to share your thoughts anything like that uh we appreciate you also following us hitting us up on twitter i guess x formerly twitter i'm still gonna say twitter every single time at afp analytics And then our personal accounts can also be found through there. We're always happy to answer questions and provide some insight. Um, Also be on the lookout rate for uh, an exciting update to AFPanalytics.com, working on building out a business and statistic glossary. The business glossary will definitely be launched by the start of the season. Statistic will probably be updated as we start going through. If you're listening to this, excited about that, and have anything you want to see included in that kind of glossary, you you have questions about what a term means, how to do something, also hit us up and uh, be happy to include that as well. And uh, we don't necessarily have any affiliation with anyone that you might hear associated with this episode. We're going to be talking about some betting odds, and all I'll say is we pulled them from a uh, popular sport book in the u.s we have no working relationship with anyone or anything like that if you are a sport book in the u.s and want to work with us let us know happy to uh maybe entertain that as well and with the betting like we're kind of throwing our own ideas our own knowledge out there we're not basing this on any models we may or may not put our own money on, but if you are listening to this, um, these are our opinions. I think we stay fairly informed and in everything, but definitely not guaranteed winners. Please, uh, please take that with everything with a grain of salt. And also, please be mindful of what you're wagering. Don't be um, betting money that you cannot lose or anything like that. And with that, we're going to get into the central division Just like every other division, we're going to work from lowest projected point total up to the top, breaking any ties kind of holistically, in our opinion, who we think would finish above or below. And that means we start with the Chicago Blackhawks. Got Connor Bedard, exciting offseason for their fans, but sportsbooks still don't seem to like them. I don't think a lot of the projection models seem to love them either. 71 and a half points is their over under again added bedard who's exciting taylor hall should be a nice fit with them and then brought in some kind of veteran leaders ryan donato could be an interesting forward second third line maybe veteran leadership overpaid for nick felino Corey perry and still kind of have question marks up and down their roster so 71 and a half points for the Chicago Blackhawks. It's a, it's a low number. I don't know where I am. Yeah, so I, I'm a little iffy on that number for Chicago. Uh, looking at 71 and a half. Now, they are supposed to be probably one of the worst teams in hockey this year. But at the same time, you mentioned some of the, uh, I'll, I'll call them, close to superstar players so bedard should be one uh taylor hall was one he's still somewhat impactful maybe if someone was watching the nhl let's say five years ago they'd say seth jones there's one i don't think so anymore i look at this roster and i say it's extremely top heavy with basically two players who are going to kind of put on a show for chicago and then there's a lot of bottom six players or bottom pairing at best defensemen and it's kind of one of those like there's some names there but just not a whole lot of a wow factor to make me excited about uh going with the over here so I, i'm not sure i think i think chicago's a team you like when you're talking over under point totals 
when you have veteran names, guys who have done it before in the league, and then you add a potential superstar right out of the gate, like I don't, I don't know what type of impact Connor Bedard is going to have immediately, but there's a very strong chance that he is 30, 40, 50 goal scorer right out of the gate in the NHL because he has that type of talent. And when you put that with, as you said, Taylor Hall's still a good player. Maybe not, he's not an MVP level player anymore, but he's also not that far removed from MVP status. Andreas Anthony is not a bad, like he can score some goals as well for this team. Again, like a uh, Ryan Donato is not a excellent first line player, but if he's in on a second, third line gets power play time, he's, he's historically scored goals in his career. And then on defense, I think that's where you kind of, once you start working back from their forward group, you start having some questions. As you said, Seth Jones, I, uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's a tough contract to have on the books for sure. Same thing with really with Nikita Zaitsev. Obviously there's reasons that Zaitsev's on that roster. It was more to take gain asset to absorb cap space. Connor Murphy's a kind of sneaky, decent defenseman. Is he playing first pair minutes? Probably not, but he's, he's at least decent, but he's really the only name on what seems to be kind of the projected opening night roster on the blue line that I'd really be okay with having. I mean, Jones is probably fine if put in the correct role, which is not first pair eating 30 minutes a night role. And then goalies, Mrazek and Soderblom seems to be where we're going here. Uh, Mrazek, I, I, I mean, I think unfortunately his best years have passed him by. Soderblom, maybe maybe he gets hot. I mean, there's there seems to be a level of potential there. So it's tough because, again, veteran team or veteran players with superstar could surprise some people. And 70-ish points is not that hard to get. I, I think I shy towards the under here, but I don't confidently do so. And this is... a uh, kind of a team I might skip altogether all and f- as far as putting any sort of bet on. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I guess the way I would view it is you, you mentioned a lot of those veteran names. And those are guys where if I have a pretty solid team and they're that kind of last piece on the second line or third line, I feel pretty good about it. Um, so, uh, Orion Donato. Um, that that's a good player to have. And if I'm like a, a playoff team, that's maybe even someone I'd look at to acquire mid season. But when we're talking about a, a full year on a team like this, if he needs to be relied upon in a bigger role or someone like a uh, Corey Perry, Nick Foligno, who are both signed, if their roles are much bigger, um, I'm, I'm just not sure if the, the firepower of, performance is really going to be there for this team um so i I think i lean towards under the 71 and a half myself um it it is tough because like you said it's fairly easy to get to 70 points and that's that's right there so it's not an easy one it's probably one i stay away from but i i would lean under yeah and i think you you brought up the idea of like oh trading pieces Looking like one of the things I've stressed in past episodes, especially when you're talking about some of these these lower teams, is what are they going to do as the season gets going as far as like trade deadline and stuff like that. Looking at Chicago's roster, maybe a Tyler Johnson could draw some interest if Chicago retains some salary. Um, Felino Perry maybe or shipped out as veterans at the deadline but those four million dollar cap hits are going to be awfully hard for a contender to absorb even at 50 percent retained for probably the impact that they're going to provide donato has two years left at a reasonable cap hit as you said he could be an interesting one but i think the i think kind of my point looking over their rosters i don't see a ton of guys that are necessarily going to be moved out 
that are really going to move the needle from where I how I feel about the the team as a whole anyways. Yeah, I I I would say I agree with that. Um Yeah, so, so it's most likely going to be a, a very similar team uh when we look at the opening night roster and the the last game of the season. I I still still lean under, I think. I would be I can't believe I forgot him considering I've I've been kind of over him and like fantasy and stuff. Lucas Reichel um don't have Cat Friendly does not currently have them on their roster and that's kind of where, where we kind of base our information as we're quickly going through some of these teams to remember who who's where and everything. Yeah, Lucas Reichel will be I would imagine on potentially Chicago's first line, if not on their second line. And he's like an underrated fantasy guy for me. I've, I've done some draft models in the past. Didn't have the time to do one this year, unfortunately. And Reichel's one that graded out really well in that going back to his draft year. And I know he's very highly touted, especially from a offensive standpoint. So under the radar, guys, he he's probably number one for me for Chicago. I mean, if you can get Connor Bedard uh, in your fantasy draft, I'd, I'd also be very happy to take a flyer there. And if someone else is going to score goals, Taylor Hall, Andreas, Anthony Sioux might be a wait around sleepers as well. But, but yeah, Lucas Reichel, I mean, he's, he's one guy, a rookie, who's probably not completely moving the needle, but I think I think – failing to mention him i think he will be uh easily top six forward i don't know how how chicago is going to structure their lineup but yeah he's he's someone that i would be excited about as well for the blackhawks yeah he, he should get those top six minutes pretty quickly i would say with this roster and especially just his potential and what his future appears to be uh, that, that should happen sooner than later so i guess final Final place for Chicago. I'm going to lean under, but realistically, I think if I'm, when it comes down to potentially putting money on it, I think I'm skipping their point total this year. I, I just don't feel like I have a good enough grasp on it, and that and their projected point total is very close to where I could see could see them finishing, so I think I skip, skip them this year. Yep, I, I don't even have much to add to that. I'm, I'm right there with you. So Chicago, again, probably is going to be more of a lottery contender, um, but then kind of starting to move up into the division. The Arizona Coyotes are the next team, uh, at least projected point-wise, 76 and a half. I got to say... And then I also have some odds from other sports books here where you can even get it a little bit more favorable. Um, I got to say, I'd hammer the over and feel really good about it with the Coyotes, who I think could have a sneaky, nice season. Yeah, I, I think I'm right there with you with, with the over. Um, they had some, I'll call them quiet additions to their roster. Um no one that is a superstar name by any means, but some real solid forwards and some pretty decent defensemen as well. Um, I look at their roster and it's, it's for sure better than last year. And I think there's certain players you could even expect to maybe take a step forward that they already had. Um, even some guys they brought in who might see a bigger role and hopefully perform well in that role. Um, But this is a team that I honestly, looking at them, knowing they're in the midst of a rebuild, I'm kind of excited for them. Yeah, I I kind of forgot, looking back over their roster, where they're at. Clayton Keller as a top line forward, he he was really good last year, and I don't think he got enough credit because of where he was playing. But if he was on a bigger team, I think he's he's not in like the top three for MVP voting, but I think he's in that discussion. And he, he's there. He's still very much in his prime. Bring in Jason Zucker, who should be a nice top six forward for them. 
Alex Kerfoot middles as a nice middle six role player are able to bring back Nick Bukes that again another good middle six player and then the big addition up front is is the rookie Logan Cooley who Bedard's the odds on Calder favorite for rookie of the year but Logan Cooley's I think going to turn some heads like he has superstar potential written all over him as well yeah I I think so Bedard's very comparable to McDavid coming into the league as this guy's just leaps and bounds better Logan Cooley I think in any normal year would be a favorite to win uh the Calder and I mean, he had some real nice highlights from the preseason. He's most likely going to come right into a, we'll call it, second-line type role, some at least second-line minutes. Um, But he's really a rookie to be excited for. There's also Dylan Genther, um, who's a winger. He's, He's not a center like Cooley, but... Um, I believe he was a first-round pick in 21. Uh, Bright future there. Um, And it looks like even he could end up on the, I'll call it third line, because they brought in some free agents as well. Um, There is Jason Zucker, Alexander Kerfoot, who both could easily move up and down the lineup as needed. Um, Zucker being a winger and Kerfoot kind of having that ability to go from center to the wing, um, depending on how their lineup shakes out. Um, But all of a sudden, Arizona kind of has some real solid forward depth. Uh, Just to toss out a couple more names, Barrett Hayton, a center who had a pretty solid season last year, and I would kind of look for him to take another step and become a more clear top six center. Uh, So there's another young player to be excited about. Uh, Nick Schmaltz is kind of the veteran at only 27 years old. They've got a lot of talent at forward. Matthias Maselli. Uh, as well, he he had a really under kind of under the radar season last year as well. Like maybe the fact he was in Arizona was was the problem, but he, he got he, like he had a great year. Got got a nice contracts off of that as well, and then they quietly made some really savvy, solid moves on the blue line. They were able to bring in Sean Dursey from the Kings in ba- what was really a cheap cheap acquisition because Arizona had the cap space. They also still have Yusuf Valamaki who has really flourished since since joining the team after a waiver claim. Then bring in Matt Dumba, bring back Troy Stetcher. Those guys should pair really well to like that's a decent top four, is it the playoff caliber top four? Probably not, but it's at least decent top four. And then their goaltending situation might be serviceable to good. I'm a big Carl Vegmelka fan. Connor Ingram's kind of bounced around. People have mixed feelings on him, but Arizona clearly has confidence in him with the contract they signed him to. So, like, their back end is not is not bad at all combined with their forward group and i hate to say it playing in uh i don't love the division we'll get we'll get a little bit further in i don't personally love the division i definitely think the western conference as a whole is weaker i love the i love the over point total but what does bring me a level of concern with this team is i hope at some point that they start taking trying to take steps forward, not instantly being sellers at the deadline. But looking at the contract statuses of especially their blue line, they have no defensemen under contract for next season. Sure, some of them are going to be restricted free agents, so the team has a level of control. But 
if someone, if a contender comes calling looking for a Matt Dumba or Troy Stetcher at the deadline, I I wish I could confidently say Arizona will keep them as their own rentals, but I don't I don't know if that's going to be the case. Same with like a Jason Zucker up front. Like a lot of these guys that that we like could also easily be sold at the deadline, which could lead to a rough stretch at the end of the season and maybe not hit quite as many points as we're thinking sitting here right now. Yeah, so, I mean, they they had Troy Stetcher last year and shipped him out at the deadline. Wouldn't be shocking at all to see that happen again. And like you said, there's the other players on the one-year deals or one-year remaining. And it, it just, it it seems like a team that could be good, but like you said, by the time the deadline passes, it's probably not going to be the same team. The real wild card, and this is really, I think, what makes it tough, is this, for the most part, is a very young team. How good are the young players? Because if, let's say, Sean Dursey really steps up and thrives in a, a well, he'll, he'll be in a, a top four role. And then maybe someone like a Victor Soderstrom takes a step forward, becomes a little bit more reliable, maybe even in top four minutes. And Valimaki is really doing well. Maybe moving out Matt Dumba doesn't hurt quite as bad as we think it might. Looking up front, a lot of young players, it would make sense to move Zucker at the deadline, turn him into assets. The teams are going to be looking for wingers like him. How bad is that going to hurt at the deadline? If uh, Dylan Genther is looking really good on the wing, it's not going to hurt as bad. But those are all wild cards. We we don't know the answer to that. And for all we know, those young players could look terrible this year, and then next season is when they break out. So it, I, I feel like a lot needs to go right um, with those young players for them to kind of keep a good pace if they start well. Um so I, I I don't know. As far as an over under here, I believe it was seventy six and a half. I think I still would lean over for sure. Um but it there's a chance the end of the year, like you said, is a little bit tough for Arizona. Yeah, I I definitely lean over. Um and and I wish I could say like lock confident, everything like that, but it's really the situation and the potential deadline thing. Plus, plus being relying on those younger players. You, you don't know. We think that Logan Cooley is going to come in and be a absolute stud, but we don't know for sure. So yeah, I lean the over. I feel decent about doing so, but I'm not, I, I, it's not a pure lock for me. Underrated guys for like fantasy purposes. Keller, I don't know if he counts as underrated, but Keller, Logan Cooley, and maybe like a Sean Jersey. Someone's going to be playing that top power play, those top power play minutes on defense at least. I would think Jersey would have the upper hand. He he put up points in LA and he should have more minutes and opportunities now with better or at least more offensive players. So he might be a kind of later round flyer or an early season waiver ad if you need another defenseman. But yeah, I Arizona, I think could be a surprising team. I don't know if I go as far to say playoffs, but frankly, looking at the other teams in the division, if they finished as high as fourth, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think it'd be shocking at all to me, which which kind of previews how where we're the where we're headed now. St. Louis Blues, eighty six and a half. I feel that that's probably about right for that team. Um, there are other sport books that you can get an over under that's a little bit lower, and I might lean over there. But really, I'm looking at eighty six and a half, eighty seven points. Maybe pushing ninety if things go well. I but I feel like right in the mid eighties is 
probably where St. Louis falls this year. Yeah, I, I have trouble with them. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to start with the goaltending with St. Louis. Uh, Jordan Bennington is not very good. He's probably going to get a majority of the time. Um, there's a chance that uh, Joel Hofer, um, who was a pretty decent prospect, I, I guess there's a chance he could push for a little bit more time, and I, I think St. Louis fans need to hope for that because if they run 61 games of Jordan Bennington again, it's not going to go well. Um, the defense in front of him has not changed. That's bad. Um, well, I guess it has changed in a way that they're all a year older, and that's not good. Um, Nick Letty, Colton Pareko, Tori Krug, Justin Falk, Scandella. Uh, it's just not good. That, that's that's an elite defensive unit about five years ago. Yep. And, <laughs> yeah, um, Scott Pernovich could be, I mean, he missed la- pretty much all of last season with injury. He seems to have a level of promise, but is he how much how much time is he even going to get and uh, yeah it's it's just mid early to mid 30s for your entire blue line does not seem like a recipe for success in a league that's going faster and faster yeah exactly and i think that's really going to be the downfall of this team is the defense and maybe the goalie combination Moving to the forwards is where I think if things go right, it needs to go really right at forward. Um, They've got some good names, some good young players, Robert Thomas, Jordan Cairo. Um, I'll throw in Pavel Buknevich. He's a little bit older at 28, but I think he's a very underrated winger. Um, There's also some players who I think might be might end up playing a little bit higher in the lineup than ideally they would be, like a Kasperi Kapanen playing on the second line. Brandon Saad, I think, is fine there, but I think at this point he'd ideally be on the third line for me. Braden Shen, okay as a second-line center. They acquired Kevin Hayes. He'll be the third-line guy, which honestly might be the best thing for Kevin Hayes to be a third-line center now. Verana's interesting on the wing. He was someone I was pretty high on a few years ago. Um, And he did pretty well for St. Louis once he arrived there. And I'd like to see that continue. Um, But there's really one younger name that I'm a little excited for to see if he has a breakout season. That's Jake Neighbors. I think they're really going to need a step forward from a lot of these younger guys. So the Robert Thomas, Jordan Cairo, a Jake neighbors. Yeah. I thought I liked the St. Louis blues roster more than I guess I do now. I can't, I came in kind of thinking, Oh, I, I think that they're easily a mid 80 point team pushing 90 points. And I, and I feel like that's, that's pretty reasonable. Talking through, looking through this roster now, their first line could be good, but I don't even know if we, if I'm confident here saying like Kyru and Thomas are being paid like true first line players, but I don't know on a, on like a good playoff contending team, if they're in that role, maybe one of them is, but if that's two thirds of your first line, I'm not even sure that that's good enough. And then it drops off fast. I mean, I guess I've maybe never been high, as high on Braden Shen as I should. Like, he's had a really good career. And, like, may, maybe there's a little new inherent captain. bias there. New captain. Yeah, new captain Braden Shen, I, I guess. Um, yeah, maybe there's a little inherent bias. Jacob Rana's absolute wild card. May, I mean, if he's a top six player, their lineup looks a little bit better if he's more of a third line player at this point. Well, they have a lot of those. So their forward group, just kind of like their defense, like maybe five years ago, 
I mean, some of these guys are not playing on their team in five years ago, but there's a lot of guys that five years ago you're excited about on their forward group. It feels like same thing with their defense. Now the game's starting to pass some of them by, I think. I feel like I could do this with a handful of different teams, but so the forward group isn't great. It's not bad. If they had the defense and goaltending that, say, like the Islanders have, playoff team, easily. They don't. They have kind of the opposite as far as defense and goaltending go. So the forward group, I think that's where you're content with this team. But when that's when being content at forward is the best thing you got going for the team, that's a concern. So when we look at that over under, uh, we said 86 and a half. I agree with you that that's right about where they'll end up landing. At the same time, I, I just, I feel like it's more likely something goes wrong for the St. Louis Blues than something goes right. And because of that, I'm going to lean under the 86 and a half. Yeah, I think I think uh again I think at a different sport book they're eighty three and a half than kind of the main one that I'm basing off of. I did I did a little research there. I might lean over that eighty three and a half, but eighty six and a half, I'm there's no way I'm betting the over with, with this team because I, I fully agree with you. There's too much that can go wrong. When when you have m- Almost half of your roster, at least half of your guys that are going to be playing significant minutes are 30 plus. That just doesn't feel like a recipe for success with, frankly, two questions in goal. So I I think they probably finished mid 80s again be, just because they have enough talent there. And like we're, we, we're knocking their defense, but at the same time, they're also not horrible players either they're average players an average team in the nhl is 82 to 86 points i think that's where st louis finishes next on the list we have the nashville predators another team that i i really don't know what to think of them 87 and a half points and I don't know. Again, I, I feel like that might be a, about right. I feel like a lot of the things we said about St. Louis outside of the goalie situation, maybe a weaker forward group, stronger defense, stronger goalies. So I don't know how we differentiate St. Louis from Nashville, to be honest. Yeah, that's that's really tough. Um we can start with the goalies because that's pretty easy. They have one of the best goalies in the league, you say Saros. Um, I don't want to keep fueling this necessarily. Um, people were kind of wondering, could he be traded this past off season? Didn't happen. I uh, That's like a a dark horse for me that come the deadline time, depending on how this team does. Maybe he's someone who could be available for the right price. And I say that because even though he's a very, very good goalie, I don't really love the rest of the team. Um, Moving up from goalie to the defense, Roman Yossi is very, very good. We know that. He is getting older. I'm not going to really hang my hat on that, though. Like he's, he's still a very good player. I don't think Ryan McDonough is the player he used to be. Tyson Berry is fine um, as an offensive defenseman. I think he's more between a second pair and third pair. Um, at this point, and just a, a good power play guy. Luke Shen should actually be a fairly decent defensive guy for them, hopefully. Um, but I, I'm not, if, if that's my top four, I'm not really excited about that. I'm 
more so a little worried because of just kind of the the question marks of do the roles fit there. Ryan McDonough's only getting older. Yossi's only getting older. Um, that worries me. I'm going to move up to the forwards real quick. And like you mentioned, this forward group is not the strongest. Ryan O'Reilly is your your top center. That's not ideal. I think if he was number two, that'd be fine. Like if they still had Matt Duchesne then all of a sudden I feel a little bit better. Ryan O'Reilly as the 1C is concerning, and Cody Glass as the 2C. Thomas Novak as the 3C. It's a little rough down the middle, and it doesn't get much better on the wing either. There's a couple of young guys I want to point out. Um, Philip, Philip Tomasino and Luke Evangelista. Those are kind of the two real young guys that I think Predators fans should be excited about. Hopefully they have a breakout season and become more of a top six player. But other than that, there's there's not a whole lot good about this forward group. I guess my, I didn't mention Philip Forsberg. He's a great player. But he's really like... When I look at their forward group, Philip Forsberg is the only guaranteed top six caliber player on this team. Yeah. Yeah, I think you talking through that, I I guess I'm – I mean, I can't say that I was op- overly optimistic <laughs> on Nashville, but, I yeah, I don't think anything you're saying is wrong. I mean, Yossi still could be very, very good. Yeah. Um, And it always comes down to, though – when you have a goalie as good as UC Soros in goal, you can steal games. And I think one thing that the Predators do have up and down their lineup is guys who can shut down games. I know Barry Trotz wants to go to a more exciting style of hockey, score more goals. That's why Andrew Burnett was brought in as the head coach. But I don't know if they have that firepower to do that but what i do think they do is get out to a lead and i think they have the ability to hold that lead with the goalies and kind of the the type of players that they have on their roster you brought up islanders earlier like that's the style of hockey this team might need to play this year to have a level of success again do they have the same level of talent especially on the blue line i don't think they have the same talent as the islanders but that's the style of hockey that can that they need to probably play. Will they play it? I don't know. But we've also seen that if they can play that style of hockey effectively, that you can rack up some points quickly. And again, I said it with Arizona. I'll say it again now. This division and the Western Conference as a whole, there are going to be plenty of teams that you can rack up points against. And Nashville might have enough talent to do that. But I still would say mid-80s is is probably where they finish point-wise. I probably lean the under of 87 and a half. I've seen some of the preseason projections that have been much more optimistic. The Athletic being one of them much more optimistic on Nashville and I just looking at talking through this roster and everything. I don't, I can't get there. Yeah. So uh, when I went through goalies, defense forwards, if you couldn't really tell where I was kind of headed, I think I go under the 87 and a half. Um, If I want to put this another way, we've gone over Chicago, Arizona, St. Louis and Nashville. I could see a world where Nashville finishes second to last with only Chicago below them. Like you said, I think the the thing that Predators fans really need to see happen is Yusei Saros just take over and dominate because that's how they'll win. If that doesn't happen, it's going to be tough. You mentioned them wanting to try and play a little more of a freestyle score more. 
I don't really get the off season moves to do that. Um, bringing in Ryan O'Reilly, then having Matt Duchesne bought out, that seems counterintuitive to being able to score goals. It's it's just a. I'm not at all confident in this team performing well. And I, I think because of that, I would go under the 87 and a half. Yeah, I think I think Barry Trotz is the GM, has a direction he wants to go. He's got a longer term vision. I think this year he wants to see his team competitive. But I agree with you. It feels like they're trying to they brought in the coach to play the offensive style. It seems like organizationally longer term they want to go offensive style. But with this roster square peg round hole, it's not going to fit together. And maybe they surprised, but yeah, I, it, it doesn't feel great. And I think I agree with you. If they finish seconds last in that division, I would not be shocked. I don't think it's likely, but I would not be shocked. Them and St. Louis are both kind of uninspiring teams this year for me. Another team that I'm personally, I don't know. I'm not as high on as well. I think, again, some of the preseason projections have been a little bit higher. Winnipeg Jets, 91 and a half points. We talked, I don't know how many times on episodes about how they're going to have some major changes, should make some major changes. And we're to the point sitting here. Connor Hellbuck's still there, which is good for points for being a potential playoff team. Defense is unchanged. I don't know if that's going to be good long term, but that's unchanged. And then forward group, Blake Wheeler bought out. And Pierre-Luc Dubois traded for Alex Iofau, gave Lardy. And that's basically, and then they're rolling back pretty much the exact same roster. If you count Nino Niederreiter as an addition, he was there for part of last season. I don't know. I mean... Winnipeg, I think there's enough talent there, but I think there's also a lot of question marks. Yeah, I think, uh, so I I guess I want to start with kind of agreeing about the goalies and the defense. It's very similar, and long-term that might not be great, but short-term this season, I think that might actually be a good thing for them. Um, Some underrated defensemen for the Jets are really their top three guys, Morrissey, DeMello, and Neil Pionk. Um, Looking at the forwards is where there starts to be a few question marks popping up for me. Um, First off, I'm going to say the Velarde and Iafalo edition and subtraction of Dubois. I don't know necessarily what the public perception is of this but I sort of think that could be at least an even trade for them when I look at the third line I think it or at least what is kind of projected to be their third line if we look at Iafalo, uh Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton I think that could be a very underrated like real solid shutdown line if that's the case, that's great. Looking at the top six is where I start to feel a little shaky. And one, it's okay, we kind of need Gabe Velarde to re- replace Dubois. And I think, in my opinion, Dubois was a little overrated. Which, at the same time, I think makes it possible, in my eyes at least, that Velarde might actually be able to take one more step forward this year and possibly kind of make up for that lost production from Dubois. The two question marks for me, Cole Perfetti was a great prospect coming right out of the draft. Can he have a healthy season? And if so, can he be that top six presence? I'm not 100% sure if he's there yet, but he kind of has to be that second line center. And then... The one question for me that I just, I really hope a good thing happens here is Nikolai Ehlers. 
a full healthy season would do wonders for the Jets because I think he's also a very, I'll call him underrated winger. Um, if he's healthy for a full season, you could see a point per game player and a very good, uh, very good forward as far as some underlying numbers are concerned. I think I think to me one of the big question marks, and you were hinting at this, is who's centering the second line. And even even who's centering the first line? I know the answer is Mark Shifley, but the one-two punch down the middle, like Adam Lowry, third line, great. Absolutely fine. There. The issue is, above him, a 30-year-old Mark Shifley and one of probably Gabe Velarde or Cole Perfetti playing center, and both of those might be more of wingers at this point in their career. But I don't know who else would potentially fit into the role. Maybe Vladislav Nemestikov comes back and plays second-line center. That just doesn't sound like a great idea either. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know... I don't know who's centering the second line. That doesn't mean that the line can't work. It probably will be a maybe by committee of Velarde and Perfetti with Ehlers or Niederreiter playing on there, but they have a lot of really good forwards. But looking at it, Ehlers probably very good first line forward. Kyle Connor, very good scoring winger. But a lot of them are maybe best suited on a good team for a third line role. Maybe Velarde and Perfetti are good second line players. I guess I don't have a good enough feeling on them because not enough sample, really. Yeah, I I think that's really the tough part here is it's a solid forward group. But looking at that top six, there's a couple guys who were more of that third line level that, well, well, I'll say a couple guys, Velarde and Perfetti, more of that third line level that you need to see the step forward to be true top six guys. But even like a, a Nino Niederreiter, I love him as a player. I think he's pretty much a good fit on any team. I think in a perfect ideal world, he's on your third line. It's not to say this is an issue, but add that to the you're not quite sure what your second line center is going to be. I don't want to say I'm not confident in this group, but I have questions that make me hesitate as far as maybe looking at a over under bet. Yeah, I think if I line this group out on paper can guarantee that this is going to be their lineup for the full season and that is uh that's a big question mark there i like i like what i'm seeing and i think this is a playoff caliber team the issue is ehlers perfetti multiple defensemen have had injury problems recently can they stay healthy and continue and play at the level that they're capable of playing i don't know and the and along those same lines where i really worry with the winnipeg jets is what happens if they get off to a slow start we sat here however many times again saying they need to make some trades they need to do something this offseason need to send some guys out. It's time to hit the rebuild. They decide to retool. Great. But if they start slow, do does that kind of start to grow louder that it's time to tear this down, it's time to rebuild? And if you start shipping out some of these guys that we have penciled in on their tops in their top six, this lineup might start to look bare really, really quickly. Yeah, I think what'll be interesting here is so Kevin Shovel Day off. If I'm running a team, and we've talked about this, so I won't go too in depth, um, I probably would have made a change there at GM because 
I'm looking to see a rebuild or at least a retool. Um, and I, I think I would want a different mind running that. Does Shovel Day Off all of a sudden become open to that? Let's say at the deadline, if they're a 500 team or a little under. I I don't know. Because he also might see it as, well, this is his chance to really push forward. And if it doesn't work, Shifley's gone, Hellebuck's gone. That might mean Shovel Dayoff's gone. It, it's tough. I, I was, so listening listening to you talk there, I was thinking in my head, and I, I guess I'll ask you this, if they're a 500 team at the deadline, do you think maybe they'd sell? Like they could, in theory, sell. Okay, this is the we we always kind of joke. What would we do versus what they will do? I would sell if if you if they are not clearly in playoff contention. Well, so U.S. Thanksgiving is one benchmark. New Year, and then into February, March. If you're st- still hovering around that cut line and again a weak weaker western conference i don't think you're going to have enough unless unless the reason that you're kind of lagging behind is like kyle connor missed two months of the season then maybe you can justify it i think they should if they're 500 at that point with everyone staying relatively healthy they need to tear it down i think everything you said about shovel day offs job being probably on the line means he continues to try to buy. I don't know how he necessarily fits another player into this lineup. I see a lot of forwards that are NHL caliber players, whether they're good enough for the role they're going to play or not is a question mark. But if Shifley and Hellebuck in particular, make it clear that, yeah, we're, we're gone in a couple months come deadline time. um, you, You need to consider getting something for them, especially Connor Hellebuck. Yeah, and I would say even what you said, where would an addition fit here? It's probably if someone gets hurt. So let's say Ehlers is hurt. Are you, You're most likely not finding that level of player at the deadline. And not we won't go fully in depth here, but the true impact of a deadline acquisition is probably not going to change a whole lot for the team. It, it It is one of those things where it's like, what would we do? We would sell. What would actually happen? I feel like they would still buy. Um, factoring that into an over-under, I believe we're going to be looking at Winnipeg being a 91.5 over-under. Even if they buy, I I lean under. My real wild card here isn't going to be a Perfetti or Velarde taking a step forward. It's, again, going to be looking at the goaltender and saying, is Hellebuck a Vesna candidate? And if he is, there's a chance, I guess, that they could beat this 91.5. But even if he is, I could see them falling below that. So for that reason, I'm I'm under the 91.5. I... I think I'm. I think I'm. I think I'm skipping this one. I, I don't want to <laughs> kind of chicken out here, but I think I, I think this is this is one. If I'm being smart with my money, that I'm skipping. I think there's an equally likely scenario where they mid 90s and mid 80s. I think both of those are almost equally likely. I think we we've made cases almost for both of those happening yep. just now. It as you said, it really comes down to what goaltending they get. Can they stay healthy? Can their defense continue basically play at a high level? Because last year it was Josh Morrissey, some Dylan DeMello, but really it wasn't the defense wasn't good enough either. Like, I don't know. Um, And then again, it's it's still the it's still the what happens if things start going poorly for them early on? Do they decide, okay, let's let's do this now. Let's rebuild. 
out. And then the other argument here is we've just talked about Chicago, Arizona, St. Louis, Nashville. We were optimistic about one of those teams, and that's the Arizona Coyotes. Someone in this division has to finish fourth or, or higher. We we don't love St. Louis, Nashville, Arizona. We probably don't love quite getting there. So a fourth place team in this division is probably finishing around 90 points. And I don't know how that's not the Winnipeg Jets, just on paper at least. So I think I'm skipping this one. I I originally was leaning under. I think if you force me to put money on it, I think I'm le- leaning over, actually. Yeah, I, I think less. this is less about the Jets as far as the statement I'm about to make and more just the league in general. I'm curious to see what the conference versus conference at the end of the year, what those win-loss totals look like because... When we went through the Eastern Conference, I was feeling a lot more confident about a lot of the teams and kind of struggling with, well, I might have just picked a bunch of overs. Here, I'm leaning towards under for a lot of the teams, and I, I think it's really going to come down to those the Eastern Conference versus Western Conference games. Those could really impact... The standings here, and I would almost say I, I I could see fourth place in this division being close to mid eighties. That wouldn't shock me. Yeah, I yeah, I, it, the division's just weak. I mean, how many years ago did Detroit want to move east? But man, if the Detroit Red Wings were in the Central Division this year, I think a lot of people are a lot more optimistic about their playoff chances and not like we talked about in the Atlantic division, Detroit's probably not sniffing the playoffs. If they were in the central division, the Western conference, I'd feel, I'd feel they have a 50, 50 shot at at getting into the playoffs. They'd probably be a popular bet. So yeah, I think that speaks perfectly in, in they're not dis Detroit's not dissimilar from the teams we've just, talked about the st louis nashville winnipeg but i would be a lot more optimistic there i think i think there's a clear top three in this division and this next team i'm i've been optimistic for in the past but even this year i'm not i'm not loving minnesota wild projected 97 and a half points at some some point someone's got to take advantage of playing weaker competition but i'm not sure that's the wild to be honest they just i don't know they didn't have cap space to work with brought back i mean they got their they got philip gustafson back not that there was a ton of question about losing him add brock faber for i guess a full season at this point bring in patrick maroon who's say what you want he's still a decent to good fourth line player i mean he's not he's not perfect by any means but i don't i don't hate him as a idea for the wild and then their forward group gave an extension to matt zuccarello we talked offline about that not sure we love that idea before his age 36 season they still just don't have unless marco rossi is healthy ready to go they still have a question at first line center realistically yeah so not to continue the trend of this isn't real easy but minnesota's kind of in a way they're kind of the i don't even know the word i'm looking for but they're that middle of the pack team that doesn't ever seem to really fall either way of being an elite contender or just one of the terrible teams. This roster makes me think they're going to continue this year to be that middle of the pack team. At the same time, I think that they could really feast on the teams we've gone over so far. Um, And there's, One thing I want to point out with their goalie situation. So 
this past season, Fleury played 46 games, and he had some games where he was still very good, but it was kind of clear that it was he was starting to decline. Philip Gustafson kind of had his breakout year in 39 games. M- maybe they respect Fleury a little. I'll say too much. Hopefully that isn't too hot of a take. Um, if I'm running this team, if I'm coaching the team, Flurry's not seeing half of the games this year. And I think that could actually be a very good thing for him. If he sees 25 to 30 games, you might see a much overall stronger stat line from Flurry. And I, I think it's kind of, you have to hand the reins over to Gustafson as you're your real number one, and does he have as good of a season as he did last year? Maybe not, but even if it's slightly less, it's still very good. I think that could kind of help a little more than I think a lot of people are noticing, is if that kind of changing of the guard happens. Um, Defensively, Spurgeon, great great player Brodeen I I think he's a very solid player Jacob Middleton very underrated um, much better than I think people realize and he has earned himself a clear top four spot Brock Faber's going to be the interesting question here because he's a rookie not much experience at all he played in two regular season games last year pair him with Kalen Addison who seemed like he could be shipped out during the off season. He wasn't. Can one of them step right in and be that top four player that they kind of lost with Matt Dumba? If so, I'm fairly confident about the defense. And then the forward group, I think they're kind of just going to be status quo. Like you said, they're missing that, that real top center. But status quo for them is almost like a forward group that the that the Islanders have in a way. No one's really wowing other than maybe one player, Kaprizov. And Boldy. That that was kind of my next my next stopping point, I guess, as far as the conversation. Matt Boldy established himself as a top six forward. And I, I think from just a, if if you want to look at the traditional points, great. If you want to look at the underlying numbers, though, very good. I think there might be another step to his game. And if that happens, that might change their, their offense pretty much. Um, if you could have two players playing at the level that Kaprizov has been playing at offensively, the concern about not having a number one center doesn't go away, but it's a little easier to deal with. Yeah. Um, I think Boldy and Kaprizov could be the combined to be two of the best wingers in hockey this year. If they're playing together, at least from a point standpoint. So gotten away from like the fantasy, like uh, sleepers, because frankly, like St. Louis, Nashville, I don't know how many guys I'd really like, take flyers on that aren't going to be on their top line. Matthew Boldy, I'd, I'd load up on, I'd load up on him. I think he's, he's a, he's someone who should be putting up a good amount of points. I mean, maybe Matt Zuckerell's maybe, I don't, I don't know exactly how Minnesota will deploy their probably clear top three wingers, Kaprizov, Boldy, Zuccarello. Those, those three guys are probably their best three guys. So they should see power play time. So should get points there. It's it's after that that the kind of they're not bad by any means. It's just a little less offensive talent, I think, for from their wingers. And I mean, the centers, I still don't know who's playing first line center minutes for them. But uh, but it might not matter if you're playing between Boldy and Kaprizov. Like that's where maybe Ryan Hartman does fit in, in that all he has to do, do the dirty work, get the puck, give it to one of those guys and let them do the rest and then just be in the right place to maybe put a rebound home like. 
that's probably a great role for Ryan Hartman to be able to fill. So I don't know a couple of years ago, anyone thinking Ryan Hartman would be like centering the best two wingers in hockey probably would be, and you made that prediction probably be looked at crazy, but Hey, that that's what might happen this year. And I think it might work just sty- stylistically this year on the goalie idea. I also like, I fully agree on Mark Andre Fleury. I think there could be a level of hesitation of giving Gustafson that many. I wouldn't discount the idea. I think more and more teams this year are going to do the three goalie thing. And Minnesota has someone who's waiver exempt in Jesper Wallstadt, who's been thought of as a pro ready goalie since he was drafted. I wouldn't be shocked if he sees maybe 10 to 20 games, depending on how things go. So then that allows you to play Gustafson, Flurry, 30-30. So Flurry's probably back to where you need it. Gustafson doesn't increase his workload a ton. Wallstack gets 20. You see what you have. Well, also maybe balancing the workload, keeping guys fresher. That might help the organization as a whole short term and really long term because they have to make they're going to have to make a decision this offseason on the goalie situation. Flurry's gonna be an unrestricted free agent. I wouldn't be surprised that this is his last year. You need to know if Wallstack can come in on a team that on and be a good one B, one A on a playoff caliber team. So free look. He'll still be waiver exempt, easy to send him up and down. So that that might help as well. I still, it's on paper, I actually think, ironically, I like the Winnipeg Jets roster better, just purely on paper. But when you start to think about some of the intangible things and just situationally, I feel more comfortable with Minnesota being the third team in that division Having said all that, I lean just under 97 and a half points. Don't feel overly great about it, but I think mid 90s is more realistic than high 90s for them. Yeah, I, I I agree there. I think that they like if this was let's say 93 and a half, maybe even 94 and a half, I'd go over. I th- don't know if they would quite get to over 97 and a half. So 98 seems slightly high. Um, so I would lean under. I'm not overly comfortable with it, though, because of the, I guess, say, lack of talent on the rosters we've already gone over. So next team up is one that I think sneaky where I might consider them as a president's trophy contender. And that might sound hot, but let me, let me uh, lay out my logic here. Next team is the Dallas stars point projection, 103 and a half. But based on what we've just talked about, someone in this division is going to rack up some points. And if the Dallas stars can kind of pick up where they left off last in the playoffs, yes, they did not win the Stanley Cup. Yes, they did not reach the finals even. But that might have been because Jake Ottinger just got overworked and kind of tired out by the end. Dallas Stars, realistically, there's not a whole lot to say addition subtractions. In Sam Steele, I guess. Out rental Max Domi. In Matthew Shane defense pretty much what was rolled out in the playoffs less Colin Miller which might be a step up for them addition by subtraction I don't know um I think I think the problem still with the stars is they still have Jake Ottinger great backed up by Scott Wedgwood and no necessarily inspiring third goalie in the AHL I think if anything derails them like to me they're a playoff lock just based on the division they're in and the roster that they have I think the only reason that you 
maybe they aren't getting a little more love for potentially being the best regular season team is it's Ottinger and then hoping that things go okay in those other games. Yeah, I mean, Wedgwood's not a bad backup, but I mean, you, you kind of referenced what happened last year, or at least what appeared to happen with Ottinger. Just it seemed like he was overworked. I would like to think that maybe coming into this year and going throughout the year, he might be able to handle a little bit more. But at the same time, it, ideally, you'd have someone you'd be a little bit more comfortable with handing a little bit more games to, which, again, Wedgwood's a decent backup, but I wouldn't call him a 1B. I I think one thing that maybe would be something to watch with the Dallas Stars we talked, I just referenced with the Wild Owl, a lot of teams think they might want to do the three goalie thing. There's a lot of teams that have three goalies in camp right now. And numbers game might have some of those on waivers. I think a couple teams to really watch for this, Detroit and Buffalo with potentially, I don't know, I don't know what direction those teams are going to go, but it could be a James Reimer, Alex Lyon, Eric Comrie, Uko Pekalukkanen, one of those guys on waivers. Potentially there's others around the league, but those names might be someone to watch for Dallas to maybe bring in as another option. I think if Alex Lyon is a possibility, I think that's a great fit. Absolutely. Um, and I, I do agree. It seems like teams might roll with the what we'll call it, the three-goalie plan. And they, yes, they could definitely use it, and it is a little bit of a concern because of what happened last year with Ottinger. Um, The other thing I want to point to that I I would say is a little concerning. So Jamie Benn all of a sudden had a great year again last year, but before that, he kind of seemed to have fallen off a little bit. He's 34. Is Was, it, was that real last year? Are we going to see that again? I lean towards yes, or at least close to it. But it's that's something I think this year I'll be keeping an eye on when watching the Stars is just is he's actually at that level again. Same can kind of be said for Sagan. He he didn't have quite the same rebound, but he was still a very solid player. And I, I guess that kind of leads me to a, I, I guess, kind of a opinion of there's some older players on this team that I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, when do they fall off? So Ben Sagan, to a lesser extent, Joe Pavelski, because he still is just an elite top-line player, uh, clearly. To a lesser extent, but in a different way, because I don't think this would impact them as much. Like a, a Dadanov, who ended up being a decent role player for them, that could matter. Matt Duchesne, 32. He looked pretty good with the Predators on a team that was not very good offensively. I think he might find a um, easier matchup night tonight, being on possibly the third line for Dallas and still having some real good wingers around him. So I, I think he's in a spot to honestly thrive, but it's still... When does he start declining? When I look at Dallas and I look at this division, I don't really worry too much about them. And I don't think every one of those players is all of a sudden going to decline at the same time. So that's why I'm still pretty confident with them. But I I guess that's just call it a storyline that I would be watching throughout the season. Another name to throw in that mix, you you looked at forwards, Ryan Suter. Uh, yeah. He had some rough moments in the playoffs. Like, if that's another person that you are concerned might be 
on the wrong side of father time at this point. And maybe they, I, I guess if, if there's a concern with Dallas, I'm less concerned with their forward group because as those guys you mentioned are starting to age a little, they now have elite guy, younger players basically stepping into their role. Rupe hints, Jason Robertson, Mason Marshman is maybe not quite elite, but he's a good role middle six player. Wyatt Johnson is the other one that yep. um big fan of. Uh, again, my draft model was a big fan of his when when he had um come out and he had a really good playoff and it hopefully can keep it going. So yeah, so Sagan Ben could take a step back, but you're looking for more from Hints. Robertson's a superstar. And Wyatt Johnson is someone who might do who might make an impact. If if I'm if you're asking me for a fantasy hockey sleeper from the Dallas Stars, Wyatt Johnson's my guy. Yep. Uh hundred percent my guy there. It's I think the question really is 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 the defense good enough? I mean, Miro Heskin in elite. And then you have some question marks. Yeah, I think uh a name to watch defensively is Thomas Harley, a uh, former first rounder. Hasn't really carved out a role yet. Seems like he's going to have one this year. He's kind of, when you look at Dallas on the blue line, he is what hopefully is the future, him and Heiskanen. Um, but that's kind of yet to be seen. That that could be a spot that they really need to uh add at the deadline is defensive defensive uh depth really and i think the team and organizations hoping nils lundquist takes a step forward as well after what they had given up for him um i i i don't know if i'd sit here confidently saying that i think i'd feel a little more confident saying thomas harley takes that step forward yeah. Lindell is still solid as well and hawk and pa is I mean, he's a good to fine defensive third pair defenseman. So, and and I'd say Hanley's the same thing. Like, I think you got a couple guys. It's really, is there someone that can maybe take those minutes away from Suter? And it's got to be one of those young guys. And it, it it's really a flip of the coin. I, I still lean over 103 and a half points really because they have a solid forward group should have a solid goalie situation enough on the blue line. And they're the, one of the teams that we feel just best about in the division. And that matters a lot. And I think it also, again, matters. I've said it before. What are they going to potentially do at the trade deadline? The Dallas stars are adding that might in a division where others might subtract that might lead to some extra points at the end of the season as well. Over 103 and a half points for me. Yeah, but I'm I'm right there with you. I I would take the over. Um, the concerns we have in the forward group, I think there's enough enough depth there that it's not really going to be an issue. Um, and defensively, I think they could end up adding there, but that's what contenders tend to do. Um, weak division over 103 and a half for Dallas. And. Point projection wise, Colorado Avalanche are the last team in the division. Projected points, 106 and a half. I like the Avalanche still a lot as a team, as an organization. Um, they are absolutely a cup contender. Having said all that, I don't know if I love them as a regular season team this year. I do Definitely would not bet the over 106 and a half. I'm not sure I'd bet the under either. I might stay away from this one as I think that 106, 107 point range is probably right around where they finish. That sounds about right. Um, Colorado had had a level of shakeup this offseason in Miles Wood, in Ross Colton, in Ryan Johnson, in Sneaky Thomas Tatar. Blue line, similar goalies right now Georgiev starter Franco has been maybe not rebounding from injury as quick as 
the organization was hoping. So there's a little bit of a question mark there. I forgot to mention Jonathan Druin also in at forward. Um, man, I, their forward group, they retooled it. Still going to be missing Gabe Landeskog probably for the season. Um, that, that's a, that hurts. It's, it's a question of health a little bit. Can like Cal McCarr, he missed games last year. Absolutely one of the best defensemen in the NHL. If he can play a full season, if Sam Girard can play a full season and really the one that I've been excited about for a couple of years now, but has not been able to stay healthy is Bo Byram. And he's another like under the radar guy for me as well that I'm really hoping can stay healthy and take a step forward as well. When he was playing last year, he was good. Um, and yeah, he is someone. So 42 regular season games. He needs to stay healthy. Um, and if he does, I think he can become a top pair caliber defenseman. Um, well, I don't even want to say can become because I think he was kind of playing at that level already when he was healthy. Um, the big concern right off the bat is Landis Gog out. Most likely um, not going to have him this year. I can't decide if I like what they did depth wise i love some of it i don't like other parts of it um i'm not really a miles wood fan um at the same time thomas tatar is like probably one of my favorite players just from a he's extremely underrated that'll be interesting to see how their third line I'll call it plays out because it's all new additions. Most likely it's Miles Wood, Ross Colton, and Tatar. I will say Colton and Tatar could bump up, I think, um, if needed. Let's say the Druin addition doesn't quite go as well as they would like. Um, so I, I I guess overall I like their depth now. Um, I, I just I wasn't a huge fan of the Miles Wood edition. The thing I want to point out with Druin and Nathan McKinnon is I believe that was a well, we'll call it a connection back to their junior days. Just from the story of it, I would love to see that work out very well for Druin. Um, had a little bit of adversity. Um, I hope that Colorado is a good home for him and he gets that chance with McKinnon on that top line and is great. Um, at the same time, looking at this from a perspective of how well is the team going to perform throughout the regular season, it's a big question mark. Um, looking at the defense we we talked about Byram I'm fine with their defense need to stay healthy McCarr and Byram um, and I'll, I'll even say Sam Gerrard he had a fairly healthy season last year but he has had injury concerns in the past um, goalie I'm a little shaky there Gorgiev had a decent season um, Frank Kuz so Cap Friendly has his leg injury as an unknown duration. I think that's kind of the status right now is they're not really sure when he would be back, which leaves a prospect goalie, uh, Eustace Anunin. I'm not 100% sure if I pronounced that right, but um, he had two games last year, didn't look too well. Um, hopefully he kind of finds his footing and is a good backup at least, but goaltending is a little shaky for me. This is a great team. I expect them to be one of the top contenders, but I feel a little bit similarly to you that over 106, so over 106 and a half, I just, I don't know. I could see them going like right at 106 or 105. I, I don't know if they'll quite have the firepower to get 
over that. I would lean under, but similarly to you, that's one I would just not touch. Yeah, I I mean, their forward group, if Druin fits in on that top line, that forward group then looks really good. If he's really more of a third line player, then I think you have some question marks. But if you can roll a top six of first line McKinnon, Rotten, and Druin, second line Ryan Johnson, Arturi Lekin, and Val Nishuskin, and then third line Ross Colton, and then I guess I have some question marks after that. But like, that top six is really good. Top four, again, assuming everyone's healthy of some combination, McCarr, Gerard, Taze, and Byram. I'm not sure there's a better top four defense when fully healthy in the entire NHL. And that top talent at the level it is could take Colorado a long way. Goalie, certainly a concern. Again, waivers could be a possibility for them, but... I I just I don't feel confident enough with as you said the goalie situation and then just staying healthy enough and teams like Colorado who have won a cup sometimes seem to teeter between turning it on and off because they don't especially in this division they don't need to be going for it all the time so I think they probably finish low 100 point total maybe don't quite win the division but there's still probably a team to watch out for in the playoffs there's still a true Stanley Cup contender in my opinion so I think I'm not touching it I think if you're looking for some underrated guys Drew a guy you you pick up late in a fantasy draft stash him on your bench for a little while and see what happens early on because there's a potential that he has a monster season playing with two of the best forwards in the NHL. Uh, So that's kind of the central conference here, central division, as we work our way through the Western conference. Um, If you have any thoughts, you want to share your opinion on this one, uh, let us know at AFP analytics on Twitter. Uh, We appreciate you listening to this podcast, subscribing on any uh, platform you might be consuming this on. And next time we'll uh, talk about the Pacific Division, maybe give a couple bold season predictions as we get towards the NHL regular season. And we'll uh, talk to you then.